So there are those four main types of intermolecular forces that we talk about in biochemistry. We have our van der Waals, our dispersion forces, our London dispersion forces, lots of different names for these interactions. But what they have in common is that they are going to involve interactions between molecules that don't normally have a charge or even a partial charge that is a dipole. Instead, these are molecules that are induced to have a dipole, like a temporary dipole, either because something um, ionic, so something fully charged comes by, something with a dipole comes by, or the electrons just happen to be whizzing over in one place more than another, and then that the ones next to them have to react to that because now you have this random instantaneous dipole that's inducing another dipole in the thing next to it, which induces a dipole in the thing next to it. And you get these powerful chain reactions that individually are weak, but collectively are strong. Those are all going to be kind of classified under this, this idea of these van der Waals as we talk about them. And so if we talk about those interactions between things that don't normally have a dipole, well, you can refer to them with any of these terms. You'll see these terms used interchangeably. They have some slight technical differences, but for the context of our class, we're just going to consider all of those terms to be kind of equivalent. And remember that even if you have molecules that don't have a charge, they can randomly get that instantaneous dipole because remember, randomness is not evenness. Randomness is randomness. If I said to spread yourselves randomly about the room, you probably spun yourselves out evenly around the room, but true randomness is going to involve those clumps. It's going to involve those hot streaks where you get 10 heads in a row when you're flipping a coin. Similarly, the electrons can hang out in one place more than another just randomly, and this will set off that chain reaction. You have these interactions that individually are weak, but collectively are strong. These forces, this is not an intrinsic desire. Instead, it's just forced together and because of the circumstances, because water excludes it, and then you can have these forces kind of just these random forces kind of have an impact. For these other things where you have this permanent charge, now these things actually, or this permanent partial charge, these can actually be um, kind of like an intrinsic desire because they always have that charge that they're going to be attracted to other charged things. But remember that nonpolar doesn't attract nonpolar. It's only when you get those temporary dipoles in a nonpolar molecule that it's then able to like be able to respond to another another thing, such as another molecule that has another instantaneous dipole. So it's not an intrinsic desire, but we can still talk about these as kind of like hydrophobic interactions. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about water excluding them. And why does water exclude them? Because of that entropy. So we have the hydrophobic effect that's driven by entropy. This pushes those things together, makes it so that those dispersion forces have a bigger impact and can be strong in numbers. If you want an individually strong reaction, well, now you want to go to the other end of the spectrum where you have permanently fully charged molecules. When we're dealing with ions, these are going to have a difference in charge, a permanent difference in charge, a full difference in charge because of an imbalance in the number of protons and electrons. Whereas our interactions when we're dealing with dipole-based attractions, those are going to have dipoles, polarity, all of this, like, like this whole idea of a dipole is not that you have an imbalance of electrons and protons. It's that you have an imbalance distribution of the electrons around the protons. And so this is how you get the dipoles. The protons are kind of stuck in place, the electrons move around them, and voila, you end up with this, this, this uneven distribution where the electrons are hanging out more with the electronegative atoms, which have a better job of kind of like wooing them. This makes the electronegative atoms get a partial negative charge, the things that got proton, the electrons pulled away from them get a partial positive charge, and you've got yourself a dipole. In the special case where you have a hydrogen bond, well, here you have a couple special requirements. You're going to need to have a hydrogen on something electronegative to act as your donor, and you're going to have to have an electronegative atom with a lone pair to act as the acceptor. For the hydrogen bond to be strongest, you want them to be at a short distance and the right angle. Because the small size of hydrogen, because of the kind of orientation and the overlap and things like this, there's a slight 
covalent character that we're not going to deal with in this class, but know that hydrogen bonds are going to be stronger than most of your dipole-based attractions. And so therefore, we'll consider them as their separate class at the high end of these dipole-dipoles, but not as strong as the ion-ion. Remember that again, these are kind of um, referring to these interactions in their singularity, but we often are dealing with these interactions collectively. If, however, we want to deal with just the strength of one individual er interaction, well, now we can use this Col Coulomb's law to help us understand this force and what makes it stronger, what makes it weaker. So if we consider all of these interactions to be purely electrostatically based, so purely based on charge, which is a major Oplich simplification, especially in the case of the hydrogen bonds. If, however, we consider that, well, now we can use Coulomb's law to help us understand it. So Coulomb's law looks pretty scary, not so bad. For F is just the force of the attraction of the repulsion. What's going to happen is that K is just a constant. Qs are the charges that you're trying to measure the attraction or the repulsion between. And what's going to happen is that we're considering them as kind of like point charges, which is gonna keep that in mind for later. We're not dealing with the complicated, big old messy molecules. And so we're just like, we'll just pretend it's just a point charge. And so those are our Qs. If we, as you, if you imagine these cues as kind of Romeo and Juliet yelling to each other that they love each other, and then what's going to happen is that the cues, the bigger the cues, the louder they're screaming, the higher the charge strength. So if you've got an ion, that's better than a, than just like a dipole, just like a partial charge. A full charge is better, and if you've got like two full charges, that's even better than a charge of like one. So higher charge, higher attraction, or higher repulsion. What about our distance? Well, distance, we have our r on the bottom. We see it's r squared. So as the distance increases, you rapidly lose the force of the attraction. So as Romeo and Juliet start walking across the football field away from one another, well, now they're going to feel each other's love less. And now the dielectric. This is the tricky one. The dielectric. So sometimes it's called the relative permittivity. We represent it with this epsilon symbol. This is talking about the solvent of that is surrounding these charges, that is intervening these charges. So it's talking about the polarity of the solution, of the solvent, of the things around the charges, not the charges themselves. Remember, we're just considering these as being point charges as a simplification. So the polarity we're talking about is in the thing in between them. So if we're in an aqueous solvent, we're going to have a high polarity. We're going to have a high dielectric of about 80. If we're, This could be like on the surface of a protein. If you're dealing with something where you have like a organic solvent, where you have something like maybe you're in a solvent like benzene, well, here you've got a dielectric of 2.3, way, way, way lower. And that's similar to what you see in the nonpolar protein interior. Well, if we look at how this is going to impact the force, well, this is on the bottom. And so if the dielectric gets bigger, then the force is going to get smaller. So what's gonna happen is the more polar the solution that's in between these things, the weaker the force is going to be. You can think of Romeo and Juliet on opposite sides of the football field, and there's a bunch of quarterbacks running in between them. It's gonna make it harder for them to feel one another's love. If you want a real explanation of the dielectric, um, talk to a physicist. I'm not a physicist, and so I'm pro my explanations will probably make a physicist cringe a little. But basically what can happen is you can think of it like this. The dielectric is kind of going to tell you about the solvent, remember. And you can imagine that you have two charge plates on either side, and the dielectric is kind of telling you about how well those charges can feel one another or how much um, the solvent is going to be blocking them. If you have a solvent that is polarizable, like water, and you, you put a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other side, the water molecules are going to orient themselves so that the positive parts of the water molecules are, so those hydrogens, remember, are going to orient themselves towards the negative charge. Whereas the negative parts of those water molecules, so the oxygens, are going to orient themselves to the positive charge. Now imagine that those that you have a plus um, charge, you have your Q and your Q, your Q1 and your Q2 on either side. So one of them with the positive charge and one of them with the negative charge. What's going to happen now is that the force, those will, if the if there wasn't, like even if there is a solvent there, what's going to happen is that you have these attraction between the forces where the, the positive force is going to be attracted to the negative force. Now, however, you have to consider that you have these solute molecules in between. 
Now, each of these solute molecules is lined up. And so each of these solute molecules, then we have to take into account the attraction forces that they're feeling. They're kind of taking away some of the force of attraction from the bigger from the bigger attraction. So we have this attraction between these cues, but then we've got all these little attractions from the water molecules that are kind of counterbalancing the attractive forces between our cues. So you can think of the force that our cues feel on one another be kind of diluted out, be counterbalanced by the solvents, by the dipoles of these solvents, by the forces of these solvents interfering. If, however, we have a lower polarity solution, well, now, even though they can kind of transiently polarize, because they're nonpolar, they're going to be not able to do this very well, and they're going to have a weaker counterbalancing field. So we feel the force in between these molecules. The force is going to be dampened. It's going to be counteracted by the polarity of the solvent lining up to kind of because um, they want to orient them, them themselves in a way that's going to feel that attraction too. But this takes away from the attraction that the two main things are going to feel. If, however, you've got that nonpolar solvent, you've got the nonpolar environment of a protein interior, well, now you're not going to have that polarity of your solvent, and this is not going to counterbalance the force. This is much more detail than you need to know for this class, and I didn't even want to go into it because I was afraid of confusing you more. But because some of you wanted to know more um, and seemed confused not knowing more, um, I thought I would just tell you just the general basis of where this comes from. The key things to remember is that the polarity of the solvent, not the polarity of the molecules that the charges are being measured between. And the the higher the polarity of the solvent, the more distraction things there are, the harder it is for them to feel, the charges you care about to feel one another. Because these charges that you don't care about, the polar solvent is getting in the way. And this makes it so that that salt bridge in the interior of a protein is going to be much more powerful than the salt bridge at the surface of a protein. And in fact, those salt bridges at the surface of the protein, even though you might look at your order of the attractive forces and say ionic bonds, strongest, well, if they're on the surface of the protein, they can actually be pretty weak and be broken up because they're going to be surrounded by a watery, salty environment where there's lots of good things for them to kind of choose instead of bonding to another part of the protein. But one of the bottom lines is that the environment matters, the context matters, whether we're talking about IMFs, whether we're talking about PKA, all these things, we always need to take into account what's around us.